1969 Dodge Charger RTSE is almost finished and ready for the grand reveal. This is a stunning example of what the Dodge Charger second generation was all about. Sleek, fast, sexy, standard 440 Magnum, Hemi four-speed transmission, 354 Dana 60 rear axle assembly. Absolutely the epitome of that era of car. And the good news is the COVID restrictions are now all lifted in the state of Oregon. This will be the first reveal we've been able to do in two years, and it's going to be epic. The owner is chomping at the bit to get here and get it, and I'm ready to have it finished up. This is going to be a reveal to remember, I promise. It's a thing of beauty, isn't it? 1969 Dodge Charger SE. Charger excitement in a stunning new special edition. Packed with extras that aren't extra on this one. In here, a world of vinyls and leathers and wood grain luxury. A new front grille just for looks, and an optional 440 Magnum V8 just for kicks. Charger's special edition for 1969. It's why Dodge Fever is more smashing than ever. Dodge is turning up the fever now. They're coming to get you, Barbara. Very deep in the Pacific Northwest. One team in Springfield, Oregon, takes on the impossible, finding dead Mopar muscle and bringing it back from the grave. Award-winning master of Mopar, Mark Warman, his cousin, Doug, his daughter, Alyssa, his best friend, Royal, his painter, Will, his assembly tech, Justin and the rest of the GYC ghouls are restoring, resurrecting, and recreating some of the fastest, fiercest, and rarest muscle cars on the planet. This is Graveyard Cars. So when the Charger came to us, it was a good, complete car. In fact, it looked like a car. It looked like it would run and drive, but it wouldn't. It had some engine problems internally in it. Now, that car was treated just like all of them. First thing we do is inventory the car, make sure all the parts that are there, and they were for the most part. I think the original carburetor and distributor were gone, but everything else was there. Disassemble the car, bag, inventory, document, photograph. We did all that. After that, we were able to get the car ready to go off to the dipper, which we did. We got it off fairly quickly. When it came back, there was a lot more damage underneath that paint and underneath that filler than I expected. Now, it wasn't terrible. It wasn't the worst car by any means. It did end up needing a lot more attention in the metal shop than I believed it was going to when I first looked at the car. Okay, so just a quick inventory of what we had to do on the body. The rear body panel, tail light panel, had to be replaced. Rear valance, rear valance corners. The trunk floor needed replaced along with both extensions, or drop-offs, they call them. Both quarters got replaced on the car. That was the extent of the metal replacement. I, I do think we ended up doing the main floor in it, too. The doors and the fender and the hood and the deck lid, they were actually in pretty good shape, so we were able to just straighten those. They didn't need to be replaced, so those are the original panels that came off of that car. So replacing the metal, repairing the stuff that was on there, it went through the metal shop reasonably quickly. After all the metal is welded on, all they do is hang fenders and the doors, probably for the 10th time, hood, deck lid, square all that sheet metal up. When that's done and you can walk around the car and you've got even gaps, at that point, we were able to kick it over to the mudroom so they could get it smoothed out and ready for Will. Michael did the body work on our Charger. It's the T7 bronze. We haven't done that yet. It's a gorgeous color. Michael's really, really honed in his skills and does a very good job for us. So when the car comes to us, at that point, we're able to kind of fine tune it, get it primered. Once it's been primered, it'll go out in the tent outside, sit there for a couple weeks to fully cure. Then we'll bring it back inside and we'll start attacking it with like 320, 400. And then after that, we'll finish it off in 600 because with a super fine metallic, you gotta make sure you have no sand scratches and the car blocked out great. So we'll finish it off at 600, then at that point, I'll send Brody or Noah outside to get it washed, get it all detailed out so it'll go in the booth, dry, then we can mask it up and paint it.
The paint job on it came out beautiful, like always. Mark always tries to take the credit because he did the pre-paint on it. This is one that he kind of followed through the shop on weekends, which actually was really nice, but because his pre-paint was great, my paint was great, I guess. But at this point, I'll kick it off to Noah, do the cut and buff on it, get it washed back in the booth, then we can undercoat it and get it over to Justin for assembly. When we got the drivetrain out, overall it was pretty decent and complete. We sent the transmission out to Brewers and had them go through it, and I took care of the engine, rear axle, and front and rear suspension. For the most part, it was a straightforward build out. The only real problem was what we saw when we took the heads off. Mark and I talked about this at the time. Not exactly sure what caused the rod to break, probably over revving like the owner said, but it was definitely broken. We were able to save the cylinder and the crankshaft. The owner actually wanted the heavy duty six pack rods installed, which was fine since we needed a rod anyway. Once it was back from the machine shop, I was able to put it all back together. Being it was a 69 440 Magnum, I've done quite a few of them since I've been here. I know the parts it needs very well. Installing the correct detail items is what makes these things come to life. Replica hoses and belts, correct date coated parts like spark plug wires and coil. Mark found a correct date coated carburetor from Tony. We sent it out to Scott Smith for rebuild. Overall, everything from air cleaner to oil pan came out great. So really all that ketchup just brings us to where we are now. The car is almost finished, like I had mentioned. The exhaust system still needs to go into it. I think there's some assembly line markings that may need to be done on it and final QC. But for the most part, we're at a point where this car is done and ready for the reveal, or very, very close. We're hoping to do that in the next several weeks. What's unique about this, and it wasn't in the old days, you know, everybody expected to see this grandioso reveal like we've had in the past, but we haven't been able to have people out. It's, I'm not complaining because, I mean, the world suffered a lot more because of COVID than not having reveals, but we've missed them. And so now this is the first time we're going to be able to do it. And I plan on really rolling out the carpet. I mean, I've done some pretty cool reveals in the past, but I think this one's going to be spectacular. we got a big reveal coming up, first one in two years. Mark uses this opportunity to make it all about him and being a dream maker and hugs and kind of makes himself the center of attention. I don't know what Will is talking about when it comes to reveals. I haven't really been involved in any, but it sounds like a lot of fun. So yeah, I'm excited to see the look on the customer's face when he gets his baby back. In 1969, Dodge Charger is the car that sets the new standard for styling as well as performance. And you won't have to tell anyone that this artistically sculpted beauty is a new Charger. The fresh new look of the 1969 Charger is as evident from the rear as it is from the front. And in 1969, Charger provides an even more formidable combination of outstanding power, performance, and handling. Making the 1969 Charger an even more distinguished beauty than the modern classic which it succeeds. You know, one of the other cars that we're working on, ironically, is also a Charger, 69 Charger, also an RTSE. I just wanted to take a minute while they're wrapping up the car and show you how and what makes this car even more unique than the one we're finishing and delivering. A few seasons ago, we introduced it. 1969 Dodge Charger RTSE 440 automatic power sunroof car. Power sunroof, power window, six-way seat, air conditioning. This car is the most loaded Charger we've done to date. It's undoubtedly one of only one ever made. I wanted to take a minute and show you what it is that makes the sunroof conversion so unique and how we have to follow every one of those steps if we want it to look the way it did when it left the sunroof manufacturer, which was American Sunroof Company. This is a regular Charger roof, regular Charger roof infrastructure, except that they punched a hole in the roof put all of the inner structure pieces, the canister, the mechanism, made it a power sunroof car. So the sunroof mechanism on these cars is pretty unique. It's different than today's sunroof cars. Everything was driven with cables that used a Bosch motor of all things in it. Another thing is, is this same sunroof basic module you would see in a Porsche, in a Mercury Cougar, anything that got a aftermarket sunroof in it, or supposed to be a factory sunroof. We did cover some of this years ago. 
This is the only other sunroof car we've ever done was our 1970 Dodge Challenger RTSE. That was a beautiful car. It was plum crazy. Houndstooth interior is a 440 Magnum car, V21 hood blackout, had a luggage rack on the back and a power sunroof. Back when I was working on the Sunroof Challenger, first thing I did was I found an original technical service bulletin. A lot of the pieces are discontinued. So like the cables, I ended up getting new cables from a guy in Australia that made them. I don't remember who it is. Probably have to find out who it is again because we'll probably need it for our other one. The entire thing is very unique and it was a big learning curve to be able to get it to work. What we want to do is keep as much original integrity to the car as possible. But if you look, you see, we've got a rotted out skin. Even where it's not rotted out, it's real thin. It's going to. That's the way it is all the way around. Rot, 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 rot. We need a skin. Now this car is a vinyl top car. And the vinyl top cars, they would hold moisture in them. And if they weren't treated properly, if they sat out a lot, which this one was a Texas car, sat out in the weather for years and years, decades and decades, they can rot. Every inch of the roof skin showed signs of erosion. Some of them you could actually see holes right through it. Other ones you could tap on it and you could feel the metal flexing. So it has to have the skin replaced. Charger's interiors continue to offer many notable standard features that are new or carried over by popular demand, like the deep custom map pockets in each door. Flush rocker type window switches are extra safe and attractive too. Floor mounted options include a console with either the automatic three speed torque flight or the Hurst four speed manual transmission. All seats have been modified to withstand higher G-forces in the event of an impact. Also, a black cloth and vinyl bucket seat has been added as a no-cost option. Back when I was working on the Sunroof Challenger, I found a Dodge Charger sunroof top. Uh, just, they cut the top right off of the car, had the whole thing with all the pieces in it. I didn't care about the section, I didn't need that. I needed all the guts for our sunroof car because half of those things were missing, the other half were destroyed. So I bought it pretty much for parts, but I've held on to that roof section for many, many years. It's been maybe almost a decade. So my plan now is the module, the big capsule inside there, that's all good. The roof skin on that donor piece is good. I need to dissect everything off in a reverse pattern to the way the sunroof company installed it and put it on as one unit so that if somebody was looking up in there later, years later, they'd say, wow, this looks like an American sunroof installation. That's our goal. So as I had said, this is our donor section. This is just an amazing piece that I was able to find it when I did and be able to hold on to it for as long as I have. Because if you look, it, this is a very unique opening. This is again, all just Dodge Charger. This is the module. This is the trough for it. Motor goes here. Cables run down through here. Because the module is welded to the skin, we're gonna leave them together. Otherwise, we would destroy the skin. We wanna leave that piece in. So we don't take all of these spot welds out. We're gonna take the module loose from the inner structure and the skin off as one unit with the module on it. So I'll flip it over and show you exactly how we're planning on making that change. I think this is fascinating. I don't work in the metal shop, so when I see a car like this with a rotted out roof, I know that 40 years ago I would have passed on it and called it a rust bucket. <laughs> <laughs> What these guys do is amazing, to say the least. The unit that you see here, that's the module that they modified and grafted into an original roof. Here's the good stuff. One, this unit is welded to the skin. That's why our process is gonna to be to remove the skin from this one with this still attached and install it in that sunroof car over there. Now look at the braces. Here's a brace that holds the center section. They've got self-tapping screws and they've just kind of bent it, just hammered it around here. That's fine, that's fine. They can do whatever they want to. They're, they're butchers, they can do that stuff. Back here, same thing, except for some reason they decided they couldn't make it out of one, so they made it out of two, which is really weird because one piece would have looked so much better. Up here, gets better. It's welded to the unit here, the brace. 
Over here, it's screwed into position, but you can just tell this is an afterthought. There's no way this was engineered. It was an afterthought. Now, one thing to say about this, I, I did a little bit of research and Tony kind of pointed something out to me too. That module that has the combination of a welded on bracket or maybe an extension bracket and then a bolt on screw on bracket, that's all because the module is designed to go in all the different cars. They didn't want to build a module just for a Challenger, another one for a Cougar, another one for a Charger. So they put the tabs on it, that bracket that would go over and reinforce it to the roof, those were unique to whatever model of car you were working on. When they needed to move metal out of the way at American Sunroof Company, they didn't dissect it out nicely and grind it and cut it and shape it. They bashed it with a three pound handheld sledgehammer. This whole area that you see right here normally looked like this, but they needed room for this motor so they just caved it all the way up to the beginning of the header. This is a drain tube for the front. When this is turned over, this trough would fill with water. They want that water to go somewhere, certainly not inside the car, God's sake. They want to exit the vehicle. So they needed to make a hole in the A-pillar. This is the A-pillar. They punched a hole with a chisel. Nice big hole right there. Ran the tube, clear surgical tubing, I might add, down through here, down through here. And then in the door pillar, which I'll show you in a minute, they exited by punching a hole in the A-pillar reinforcement. That's butchery. Oh, this is very true. If you go look at the actual hinge pillar itself, between the two hinges, you'll see where they've punched a hole in it and that's where that drain tube goes out. Same thing at the rear wheelhouses. Go back there and take a look. Right in the wheelhouse, they came down that blind pillar, the C pillar, and needed to make a penetration in the wheelhouse. They just took a chisel and bashed a hole in it. So we're not gonna clean it up because if somebody came back later and says, why has this got really nice hole saw bit holes in it instead of being chiseled out, they'd say, well, maybe it wasn't, even though we've got all the documentation to prove it. Our process is gonna have to be the same. We can't reinvent the wheel. So we'll have to fasten these in the same fashion that they did at the factory once the skin is on there. We'll just do a much more sanitary job of welding, of making sure that everything is protected from rust. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna send this out and have it dipped as soon as it comes back. We will have the roof skin dissected off of it and ready to install on that one. In the meantime, he can go ahead and dissect that one off of there. This car is pretty much my baby ever since it came over from paint. I'm the main assembly tech here, so bolting them together is my job. And it's also the best job in the shop. I install the taillights, rear bumper, taillight trim, backup lamps, door handles and lock cylinders, outside mirrors, interior trim panels, carpet, seats and console, dash assemblies, all the glass and the mechanisms, exterior trim and all the ornamentation, header panel and headlamp assemblies, front bumper, front valance and park lamps, Overall, everything that goes on this car after the drivetrain is installed is up to me. Like with most builds, the most fun thing to put on these cars are the decals, if they get it. In this case, the car was coated for a bumblebee stripe, which Mark and I installed that. Once that was done, we had to wait for the ECS exhaust system to show up, and that's where we're at now. When installing the exhaust systems, the first thing I install are the head pipes and I leave those loose. After that, I install the mufflers and the hangers. So basically, I move my way from the front of the car to the back and I leave everything loose until I have the full alignment. After I have the mufflers and hangers on, I can install the over axle pipes. And it's really important to get the correct alignment for the tips. Another reason to leave them loose is the tips clamp to the tailpipe, and they have to align perfectly with the rear valance. For example, if the over axle pipe or the tailpipe are not in their precise location, then you can't get the right alignment on the tips. The other thing you have to be careful of is dinging the pipe or scratching the car somewhere. Everything is metal, so if you get crazy slinging that pipe around, you'll create a lot more work for somebody else. If you just take your time and think everything out, it's just a one-person job. When the entire system is installed, they start tightening it from the very front and working their way to the back. That's the way it's done. The last thing to tighten down, of course, is the tips. This car is coded for that. That's N42. All of your 440 Magnums are gonna get an N41 dual exhaust, but they don't all get the N42 bright tips. That's an option, you pay extra for that. If it was a California car, an emission car, it wouldn't have tips on it. They'd be turned downs. This particular car is an N42, so it's gonna look really sweet back there with that chromer bumper, the little bezels on the backup lights, just enough chrome for it all to tie together. 
There's nothing finer than the bottom of a car done right. I just love the final look. Let's see how many of you were smart enough to pay attention. Which floor-mounted shifter was not available on the all-new 1969 Dodge Charger? Three-speed automatic torque flight, Hurst four-speed manual, or the three-speed manual transmission? Stay tuned after the break to find out if you are correct. Welcome back. So, are you confident with your answer? Which floor-mounted shifter was not available on the all-new 1969 Dodge Charger? If you guessed three-speed manual transmission, you win. The rest of you are just plain dumb. The three-speed manual transmission was standard on most non-RT models. However, it was mounted on the column. We call this a three on the tree. In addition, newly positioned door lock buttons will save a lot of effort and exasperation for front seat drivers and passengers in these new chargers. The new dome courtesy light is flush mounted for greater safety. Charger's highly praised sports instrument panel continues to offer full width padding for above and below. As I mentioned on the Sunroof Challenger, it was just an empty shell. You look at it, it's just sitting there on a trailer with nothing else. We rounded up all of the front suspension, rear suspension, and restored it. Got a date-coded F440 HP2 and a correct transmission for it. The body and paint wasn't bad. It was a good shell. It was out of Arizona. You know, those are the cars that tend to survive that desert stuff. They don't see the rain, they don't see the sleet, and they don't see the salt on the roads. This car got put together and assembled by the original Graveyard Cars team, Houndstooth Interior. It's a beautiful car, six-way seat. Of course, it's an RT, so they're all rally instrument clusters. AM8 track, three-speaker dash. As a matter of fact, the first time, this is funny, Philly Steak was on the show, was when we were doing that car. He came out and we had the car there and I was rattling something off and he corrected me because he needs to do that. You know there's a difference. Do you have the right uh, speaker curls for it? Difference in what? Uh, Barracuda and Challenger. Makes him feel, you know, good to put me down. If that's what you want to be doing when Jesus comes back, Tony, put me down. I'm just kidding. Tony keeps me in check. In the old days, if you go back and watch some of those episodes, I was just rattling all kinds of stuff off. Just because you've been saying something for 30 years doesn't make it true. So he would stop me and correct me. I go, no, that's no way, no way. And I'd look it up and he was right. I bought a 71 Dodge Charger 500 with a factory hood on it. It was a bulge hood. But it oh. wasn't put there from the factory. Okay. It, you it know, doesn't, it, you it, know. Speaking of our plum crazy 1970 sunroof challenger, I was pleasantly surprised to watch one of the big auctions and that car showed up at it years later. Did you guys see that Barrett-Jackson auction? So I'm sitting there watching Barrett-Jackson, see one of the cars that we restored, beautiful car. It's coming down the block, and what do they have? And I'm sure Mark probably paid extra to have somebody do it, but it's a cardboard cutout. And they had this big, huge cardboard cutout of the ice tray hanging up through the sunroof opening as it has restored on graveyard cars. That car did really well. It's absolutely ridiculous. It's all about him again. It, I think it's over $127,000. My client, when he bought that car, I believe he paid $2,500. And I think the restoration was maybe 30,000. I mean, we were pretty cheap back then. Sorry, folks, prices have gone up since then. And it sold for 127,000. I thought that was just absolutely the coolest thing to be sitting back watching an auction and seeing that come through. So some work has been done on the Charger. We're not huge fans of blowing the car completely apart so there's nothing left of it, unless that's just the end result and you have to take every single piece of metal off of it. In this case, we will end up replacing a lot of metal, but we do it segmented. So you'll see that the trunk floor is replaced. It goes in over the original frame rails. Now this is a good thing because it holds that integrity together at the back of the car for when you do cut things off like the roof or the quarter panels. We've replaced the main floor in it. That came out beautiful, by the way. Josh did a phenomenal job on it. So your 
basic foundation is in there, new, replaced, and solid to help hold that car together. I've worked in a couple different body shops, and I've worked on all types of cars. Now that I just work on the one brand of car, it allows me the chance to really memorize everything and really master these vehicles. So like on the trunk floor and main floors, I know right where all the frame rails are and the frame extensions are. So it allows me to map out everything I need for the plug welds and spot welds. This makes a super clean, sanitary, and real fast job out of it. When you stand back and look at it, it's really hard to tell that these are AMD parts versus original floors. So the sunroof charger is now ready to have the skin removed from it, along with the original module. The other unit, the donor unit, is out being dipped. Hopefully by the time they get the skin off of it, everything cleaned up and treated, because they have to treat the inside for rust and preventative things and cavity wax. But by the time all that's done and it's cut and trimmed, we should have back the donor piece so we can get it dissected and installed on the car. So far, this is my favorite car to work on because it's so rare. Sunroof really sets it apart from everything else. Mark pointed out how he wanted me to replace the roof skin assembly, which made good sense, so I went to town on it. First thing I do, I grab a paint pen, and I mark all the factory spot welds and MIG welds so they're easy to see. Then I go back and I grind and drill as is necessary until the panel's loose. So this is a slow process, takes a lot of forward thought. You gotta pay attention, take your time so you don't damage everything underneath what you're taking off. Once all the welds are removed, I can just lift the panel right off the car. Once the panel's off, I like to clean up all the rust and the scale, and then I like to treat it with POR15, which is a rust converting sealer. Once it dries, any rust or flaky metal is now protected and solid. So now that the roof skin's all off and all prepped out, as soon as the donor roof comes back from the dipper, I'll get to ready to install it. In the meantime, I'll cut off the used quarters, I'll get those all fit, and I'll put those in place. In 1969, Charger again offers unrivaled styling excellence, as well as continuing leadership. No car will match its beauty. That new grille is all charger and two yards wide. Boldly divided and deeply recessed for more of that clean machine look. There will be no mistaking charger's unique full taillight design. Beautifully sculpted and distinctively divided. Wrap up the overall package into one unified, cohesive design that continues to make Charger the most wanted two-door hardtop of any make. All right, with the exhaust system installed and sounding beautiful, this thing is ready for me to call the owner. I am so excited. Like I said, the first reveal in two years. Guy's coming out from Minnesota. He's been really, really patient with me. Whoop. <laughs> But he's a nice guy, he's just out of patience, so I know he's gonna be thrilled to find out his car's done. They are actually got the car right now down at the old mill where we lease the area to keep the cars dry now, and they're doing their final glamour shots of it, and a couple of them came through. Show those right there. Absolutely gorgeous. That car looks amazing, and it's gonna be the best reveal we've had in many, many years. Like I mentioned earlier, I didn't get a chance to be part of any of the reveals, but I think my favorite one that I saw on the show was the Coronet RT for Mr. Torino. It was a gorgeous car and ultra rare. 
I didn't do a ton of work on the car, but I did help on some of the assembly. I know that Brett could and has bought almost every collectible Mopar under the sun. So for him to smile the way he did on the reveal really made me proud. This is why I don't like reveals. You know, Doug's story is very heartwarming, of course, but just go back to the beginning. All right, are you guys ready? Ah, we're Thank ready. And I'm gonna have the display lights come on, okay, Jeffrey? Okay, three, two, one. <laughs> what the? <laughs> if she thinks for a second that she's gonna beat me out of that reveal, take my glory, steal the thunder, it ain't gonna happen. You know, you got Mark got, consistently got, making it about him. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I thought I was gonna miss this. You know, you, you lose the sentiment value and all of it, and they're just, I'm not a fan of reveals. One of my all-time favorite reveals here was Kimberly Cook's 1970 Barracuda. It was really incredible and raw. She actually cried tears of joy. I really connected with Kimberly Cook's reveal for her car, and you can connect with it so well because she lost her father, and I lost my father-in-law, and him and I, we watched the show together every single week, and that really hit home for me. Unbelievable. <laughs> Thank you. You know, look at Kimberly Cook's beautiful car. He takes a great moment, like, hey, here's the original steering wheel that your dad used, which is sentimental and amazing, but then he also makes it about him also. So, again, it's, it's, I'm just not a fan of these reveals because it's always about Mark. You know, I'm just trying to make memories here. <laughs> I didn't know that was a crime. I'm trying to make something special for the people, not for me. This has nothing to do with me. But I guess if you just want to label me a villain and a no good SOB, then go ahead, Will. That's fine. Let me guess, I, I killed Kennedy too. Yeah, I was nine months old, all right? I can't be a villain all the time. Ding! <laughs> so my favorite reveal so far was our 68 Roadrunner for Curtis. Beautiful blue on blue car, 383 four speed. Car came out great, absolutely beautiful. And the best part about that reveal, Mark wasn't in it. As we just sent the car 3,000 miles away, they got it, they recorded it with their phones, and that was it. No reveal. There you have it, folks. 1968 Roadrunner, one owner. Well, I hope Will's happy. Just received a telephone call. Went up, grabbed it, shouldn't have. It was a little tiny dancer. Mark wants me to work with some of his clients and be his communicator. So, I'm communicating. Told you they're down there doing glamour shots. Told you that, right? Down there doing glamour shots of the car. Asked how it looks. Tiny says he loves it. Who's he? The customer. How is the customer down there looking at my car? From the side. America's most beautiful shape remains virtually unchanged. Changes such as these side marker reflectors have been purposely kept to a minimum to preserve Charger's unique styling and identity. Also new are these 14-inch chrome stamped road wheels and trim rings. And these optional F70 by 14 tires are available with either white or red striping. Belted fiberglass tires are also an option. Optional vinyl roofs are available in four colors, white, black, green, and tan bore grain. Here's what I don't understand about any of it. Everybody knows I was building up for a reveal. I shouldn't get this phone call. When he called Jeffrey and said, hey, because Jeffrey's been doing a lot of our communicating, so he has that open door to our customers, and Jeffrey says, come on down. I mean, I gotta wonder what's wrong with the little tiny dancer. Hey man, I'm just doing my job. Why tiny gotta stab me in the back, man? Trying to upstage me, whatever, man. You're five foot nothing, a hundred nothing, get over it. I'm five six, that's, that's average height. Well, for a woman. You know, there's a lot of planning goes into revealing a car, coordinating with everybody, making sure the set's all done up, running through it 10 or 15 times, making sure there's no embarrassing moments. I've got three little nuts here to put it on with and a ratchet. <laughs> well, that's ruined now. Bruggerman was an awesome reveal. This couldn't have worked out any better. The car looks amazing. Bruggerman calls Jeffrey and says, hey, I'm here. And Jeffrey, not knowing the difference, because he's just Jeffrey, he just walks Bruggerman right to the car. Says, here you go. So there was no big, hey, 
come be surprised. It was before you know it, he's there looking this car over and it was done and over with. Thank you, Jeffrey. Oh yeah, 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 open the hood, open the hood. That's great, look around, uh, yeah. Crawl up Mark's butt with a flashlight, it's great. Uh, yeah, go around, check in the trunk. Open that door, have a seat, <laughs> make yourself at home. Hope you're enjoying it, okay? I hope you guys are enjoying the most boring reveal in Graveyard Cars history. Beautiful car, great job, nice guy. Boring reveal. Ooh, it's selfie time. <laughs> Look everybody, I'm getting a picture of me next to my car. Who are you and where are you from? Patrick Bruggeman, Crookston, Minnesota. That's like 130 miles from the Canadian border, 35 miles from the North Dakota border. So we're way up there in the corner. After Pat took the big Cleveland steamer on my beautiful reveal I had planned, he wanted to bring the car back to the shop and go over it with me. And standing here alongside me is a couple good friends, Arlen and Hugh. My name is Larry. This is my brother Daryl. My other brother Daryl. New Heart Show. Say, oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, sure, Dan. <laughs> <laughs> I found the car in an ad way out in uh, Lawton, North Dakota, was the place. It was back in uh, 76 or 77. I decided that I wanted to drive out there. I wanted another four speed car because my kid brother wrecked my 69 Roadrunner. And so I found this car and I thought, okay, we're going to go look at it. So we went up there and it was uh, belonged to a, a, a school teacher. I cannot remember her name, but the car was purchased for her by her father when she graduated from teaching school. I bought it for $900 originally. And then the car was with us for many years until my wife and I started raising a family, built a new house, family took over. I had to sell the car. And I was never the same after that. It hurt so bad. So finally, I, I kept after the guy, and I kept after the guy, and I wound up getting it back, and I swore it'll never leave again, and it won't. And now she's so beautiful. It's just unreal. I'm not mad. I'm just disappointed. I was planning a magic show. I had the car planning on levitating by using an in-ground lift underneath it so it looked like it was floating up like something from Exorcist, right? But then spinning it around a little bit, like kind of like Ghostbusters, right? When your car's broke down and it's rusted apart, who are you gonna call? Call Ice Tray. Mm -mm -mm. I mean, this was a gala event, like the Oscars. Are you ready for some trivia? True or false? Optional vinyl roofs are available on the 1969 Charger in three colors. White, black, and tan bore grain. If you think you know the answer, stay tuned until after the break to find out if you're right. Okay, so how do you think you did? Optional vinyl roofs are available on the 1969 Charger in three colors, white, black, and tan bore grain. If you guessed false, you win. All three of the colors are available. However, a fourth color, green, was also available. Continued as standard equipment is the popular racing type gas filler cap with a new flip up top and the word fuel inlaid across the cover. And with beauty in mind, Charger continues to offer vacuum operated concealed headlights as standard equipment. Okay, all kidding aside, I don't want anybody getting mad at me for having some fun here. Pat is a wonderful guy, he's got a heart of gold. All right, everything's in good spirits. He is very, very happy with his car. It came out absolutely gorgeous, and he's proud to tell people that Graveyard Cars did his car for him. Oh, I think it's absolutely gorgeous. I mean, it's just beautiful to shine on. It looks better than it probably ever has in its life. I'm gonna be very proud of it. There's a lot of people back home are waiting for this car to come home. You know what, I just like to have fun with my clients, that's all. Keep the mood light. This, there's a lot of tension, a lot of money flying around, so that's all it is. And when it comes to the reveal, I'm disappointed because I did have something pretty cool planned, but it really wasn't about me. It's about the car, it's about the client. It's about memories that this car will be making 
for years to come. Phantom Cuda. We're gonna go on one, five, four, three. You ready? Yeah. Two. Hey, everybody. What is it? Lunch is ready. That's lunch. That's lunch. <laughs> Let's go. Sorry, guys. I don't miss yeah. no grub, man. We're gonna do it after That's lunch. That's lunch. So we had a new drive shaft made for this. Okay. I, I like doing that. It's a replica of the original one, except that it's brand new steel. It's not pitted up. It's originally they were a natural metal finish. That's why they're so rusted and pitted. They had no sure. treatment on them. You know, it was nice to be able to walk around the bottom side of the car with Pat and show him our labor of love. That was one thing that uh, back in the days when I drove it, it would always pull one way or the other. Oh, drums you'd were get in, You'd get in there, you'd adjust it. them a little bit, then it, you know, yep. you're always playing with it. Yep. So I think that was a very good move just for drivability. And they really work a lot nicer. There is a more stoppability to them. So right. I noticed when I was driving back, I thought, boy, the power disc brakes is a nice feel for the foot. It's a nice feel in the pedal, and it really does stop the car. So we were way behind on the car, like we are everybody's cars right now, and I appreciate everybody's indulgence and understanding. But oftentimes when that's the case, I'll go the extra mile on his car. I did the same thing. A lot of little things that really, like converting it to power disc brakes when it was an original drum brake car, replacing something instead of trying to repair it or living with some pitted up control arms. We found the best suspension pieces, the best axle housings, the best everything for this car. Oh, we modified your radio. Our friends over at Instrument Specialties. Oh, okay. That is converted to AM, FM, and Bluetooth. Now it's way past my pay grade, probably be past your pay grade on figuring out how to do it. Because it appears like a stock radio. Okay. But it's how many clicks you move it, oh. make it go AM, or double click, it goes FM. Same log, same everything, just looks like an AM radio, but you have all the functionality. That is cool. It is cool. Those are my little contributions, so when you get the car home, and yeah, we're behind on it, and it took too long, you're so in love with the car, and you realize it probably was worth the wait. No, it's a very so, nice car, very, very, very yeah. well put back together. Yep. Like he's uh, driving a brand new version of what he originally had. No, we couldn't be happier. I think it's absolutely beautiful. These guys both agree. You know, it's been a little bit of a wait. Uh, Mark knows how uh, impatient I can be. And when I tried to throttle myself as much as possible. Oh yeah, Pat throttled himself on a Saturday night at 11 o'clock when I got his text about how his wife had had some kind of surgery. And if anything happened to her before that car got back, we were gonna have trouble. That's a threat, Your Honor. The beautiful part, I hardly slept at all. I wake up at six o'clock in the morning to a text. It's a picture of him out on a boat, fishing with, I presume, his wife. I thought she was in the hospital. You know, I lost a whole night's sleep because of you. Apparently moonshine's a hell of a drug. <laughs> you know, Rick James, crazy, man. I never drank no moonshine. Does that make you bipolar? Yeah, Tiny shaking his head. You're dead to me, Tiny. So you can just, but everything turned out perfect. I couldn't be happier. It is so well worth the wait. I'm just, uh, I'm beside myself. It's just beautiful. Really happy with it. <laughs>